Hello to everyone. When I joined a giant beauty company 15 years ago to work on sustainability, I have to admit that I was clearly underestimating the amount of impact sustainability would have, not only to my personal life and to my career, but also the growing impact of the two peak on society. I grew up here. Does anyone of you know where this is? Well, I guess nobody. This is a very tiny village in the west of France. And my roots here help me to build strong links to nature. I will come back on this concept of roots a bit later in my speech. Now, I live in Paris. I'm a mother of 43. And I can tell you that the more I get older, the greater importance sustainability has in my life and in my job as well. Why? Why is sustainability so important to me? My children today are 8 and 12. And I always wonder how the world will be for them and how to reassure them when they ask me, hey, mom, why did we have so many fires in the summer in France this year? And where we would go as so many as to go in this type of crisis? This is what drives me every day and in my life and in my job as well. Well, prior to joining L'Oreal, I was a young engineer in agricultural science. My first job consisted in improving small-scale farms productivity, mostly in emerging countries, so as to secure sustainable food access to people in countries already facing the first impact of climate change, water scarcity, conflict of use for lands, any kind of resource, natural resource scarcity. At that time, my role as a scientist and as an engineer was mostly to find technical solutions to environmental problems. But this is also when I first experienced the human face of environmental crisis. I remember in particular when I was a young research fellow in a public research institute for development in Dakar, Senegal. I was asked to work on a specific program to improve traditional fishery productivity. There was a big environmental issue in the mangrove, and mangrove is a very important ecosystem for fishery production, and that was affecting national fishery stock. What struck me most during that job, of course, far beyond the environmental crisis I had in front of me, was the impact of this environmental degradation on people. The fishermen had to leave their villages to cities so as to make sure to sustain their family livelihood. The pollution on the seashore was so important that it was dramatically impacting children's health. And the women that was left behind in the villages had to face alone water scarcity, poverty, and food insecurity. It was a very crucial period in my life when I understood that I could never do something else in my professional life than trying and contributing to find solutions to environmental degradation combined with social inequality. Since then, I've always wanted to be in a position, being in a company or anywhere else, where I could have a positive impact on the world. After a few years in different public research institutes and small-scale mission-driven company, L'Oréal called me. I have to say that I was a bit surprised, curious, very curious, but also skeptical. Skeptical about the role I could play and the kind of impact I could have from this multinational beauty company perspective. But I'm curious, and I wanted to take the challenge. My mission there was clear. I had to build the first sustainable sourcing supply chain so as to secure the access to new natural ingredients. Sustainability was not at all the buzzword it is now in corporates. It was very new, but the company wanted to increase the proportion of natural ingredients in its product portfolio, but had to secure new challenges raised by this strategy, such as securing traceability back to farms, ensuring respect of human rights for anybody all along the value chain, making sure that we had no um, damaging impact on the environment. And that was a new challenge for these teams. Even 15 years ago, um, this 
um, natural ingredients were sourced in countries um, already suffering from some of the impact of climate change, such as air loss of biodiversity, water scarcity, land degradation. I remember in particular my first projects, such as the sourcing of argan oil in the south region of Morocco, sourcing of she butter from the west of Burkina Faso, or again the sourcing of guar gum in the Rajasthan region of India. My mission was to support the purchasing department to secure sustainable access to these ingredients while contributing to positively uh, to socioeconomic development of this territory through the sustainable use of biodiversity. That was mostly mission impossible, trying to reconcile at the same time flexibility of supply versus the need of predictability of long-term demand for a long-term adaptation of sustainable farming practices. Cost optimization versus maximization of producer revenues. Securing increasing volumes for the company versus limited natural stock of resources. But I come from this very tiny village of France, and my roots told me that I could take the challenge. I had the voice of my grandmother remember me. Sorry, in French, la persévérance vient à bout de tout. In English, meaning perseverance overcomes everything. And my French roots helped me um, to pilot the first project I had in charge and to be able to challenge the challenge I had ahead of me. I remember in particular one of the first projects I had to um, work on. That was in Burkina Faso for the sustainable sourcing of she butter. Shea butter is a very well-known cosmetic ingredient which has been used for years. It's coming from the natural forest of West Africa. Nuts collection is a very traditional activity um, which is happening once a year for about three to six months during the rainy season. That's a very complex season for people there because there is no, nothing in the grain stores. And nuts collection and selling is the unique source of revenue for people to have access to food. The end collection and the pre-processing of the nuts before butter manufacturing is exclusively done by women. This is a very traditional activity. And these women are often grouped in cooperatives. This is a country, as many other, um, where women do most of the agricultural work, even if few of them have real ownership of the land. They suffer. Ac lack of access to education, to finance, sometimes to technology, which prevent them very often to developing their own business and to adapt climate smart techniques to better adapt. In the first years, with my colleagues from the purchasing teams, we did our best to contribute improving the very harsh condition of working of these women, proposing technical training to improve the quality and therefore the price of their production, reinforcing their business skills so that they could run their own commercial activity, applying certified fair price, even sometimes reinventing totally the way we did business before with suppliers by contracting in the long term on volumes and price and sometimes even paying in advance. However, was clearly not enough to counterbalance the growing impact that climate change had in the area and especially on these women's life. Years after years, these women told me that they had less time to dedicate to commercial activity, including for sure she nets collection, due to the increasing time they had to spend to collect water and wood for fuel due to the growing deforestation, the acceleration of desertification in the area. They had to take longer walking routes for water and wood collection. And most of them were even asking their daughter to come with them at the detriment of going to school. For those who had small piece of land to sustain the basic needs of their family, they experienced massive reduction of their crop yields, which affected, of course, the health and the nutrition of themselves and of their family. And in some region, we even saw the rate of child marriage going up again after years of reduction. 
the impact of climate change in the zone is dramatic and clearly disproportionately affecting women. As in many places of the world, women, as people who are marginalized or poor, are being disproportionately affected by the impact of climate change. That's because women are likely to be in condition of poverty, more likely than men, have less access to basic human rights, such as the ability to freely move or to access their own land. They also face systematic violence that escalates during periods of instability. These factors, and many more, of course, means that climate change, as climate change intensifies, women will bear the consequences. Let me share some important numbers with you. In many countries, women and girls remain in charge of water collection, and they spend 2.5 more time, sometimes in very unsafe condition, to collect water and energy. Worldwide, women represent 80% of the climate refugees and they are 14 times more at risk to die in case of natural disaster. This is an example of Burkina Faso and many other similar countries in this context. We decided to harness the specific impact of climate, that climate change had on female um, communities, developing gender-based climate adaptation interventions. For example, developing accessible insurance system for these women so as to make sure that they were insured when, in case of crop loss due to climate events. Diversifying their production and therefore their source of revenues. Providing facilitated access to clean energy, saving a lot of women's time and money and reducing their exposure to smoke. This is one of the many projects I had the opportunity as a sustainability practitioner in company to work on. And this is all part of the sustainable sourcing policy of the company, which is today implemented by many experts in sustainable sourcing back up by experts locally. After this step, and while sustainability um, became a topic of more resonance and of more strategy in the company, I progressively extended the scope of my responsibility in corporate responsibility, switching from very narrow domain of expertise to a wider leadership role in global sustainability ambition of the company. But of course, based on what I learned with these women, thanks to these women. After some time in the corporate sphere, I still remember notably how proud of the positive impact I had been able to contribute when the company launched the new phase of its sustainability journey. I remember, two years before, my boss literally put in front of me a white page asking me to design what would be for me the truly sustainable company for the world. After months of internal workshop, many technical studies, stakeholders consultation, I finally proposed a plan, which to my perspective was the only plan, was the only possible scenario for humanity, respecting planetary boundaries all along our product value chain. And the plan was adapted. I work today as the environmental leadership director. On our side, time is anymore to new commitments, but rather to the execution of the sustainability journey we have committed to. This is, of course, the other part, and things are far from being easy. The company I work for is still not perfect, but I'm quite reassured. When I feel the tremendous awareness and the eagerness for mobilization from women, from men in the company, when I think back to the young engineer I was in Dakar, Senegal, all along this great sustainability journey of 15 years, I've learned two main things. First one, you don't have, and we don't have all, to work in NGOs to contribute to issues we are facing in this world and to make a big difference. Company as well understand that there is no alternative for, for business than being sustainable to stay profitable. 
This company are composed by men, by women, who want also their company to really act and lead by example. Second important learning for me has been that expert knowledge is not enough to lead the change in complex organization. As a scientist, I had clearly to refocus my strengths on leadership. As a woman, I had to refocus my strengths in self-confidence. And as a sustainability leader, I had to refocus on networking and collaboration, because success is never made alone. I'm not an activist. I'm not a politician. I'm even not a business leader. But I know that I can have an impact on the way my company acts, on the way it does business. And I feel individually responsible for that. And every day I act and I take decisions according to my values. Time is running too short to wait for the intervention of a magical expert or any transformative leader to find solution to the challenges we collectively have in front of us. It's everyone's roles and responsibility to be responsible in their sphere of influence and to act according to their values. We all have our leadership style to influence the change we want to see. As young leaders, you as well can all have a determinant role in your respective organizations with your own style, own skills, and own journey. Just think back to your roots, stay truly yourself, and ask the good questions. And thank you for your attention.